The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism. Tonight on The Agenda. With fentanyl, bystanders or EMS can give them Narcan. In a toxic drug like this, we don't always have anything that we can reverse that with. Then, later, we uh, passed what was called, or what became known as the English-only resolution, and uh, are, I think, still paying for it uh, many years later. Also tonight. That is a very common myth that people believe if you're in dorm or you work with a bunch of other women, that all your menstrual cycles are gonna get in sync and you're gonna have this sort of like menstrual gal pal sort of thing. Uh, and it's not true. Last week, officials in Belleville declared a state of emergency after paramedics responded to 23 drug overdoses in a span of just two days. It's another deadly chapter in the ongoing opioids crisis in the province and country. With us now for their insight in Belleville on the north shore of the Bay of Quinte in eastern Ontario, there's Jennifer Cormier. She's executive director of the John Howard Society of Belleville. And here in our studio, Dr. Carolyn Snyder, emergency physician at Unity Health Toronto. Dr. Snyder, good to have you back here at TVO. And Jennifer Cormier, nice to have you on the line there from Belleville. Uh, we did want to start with the Belleville story because it is so shocking. 17 overdose cases in a span of 24 hours, 13 of them within an hour and a half of one another. Jennifer, can you tell us what is the leading cause behind the current spike that's happening in your city? The leading cause is that the drug supply is tainted. Um, and so uh, this is a, a systemic problem. Um, the systems need to communicate with one another, but the reality of the problem is, is that everyone is just stretched so thin and has been for so long um, that with these types of increases, we just can't keep up anymore. You say tainted, tainted how and why and by whom? So I don't I don't know that yet. I know that uh, we have amazing um, officers right now on the streets that are trying to figure that out, the why with the what um, and by who. Uh, but it is something that has um, come in contact with the homeless population. And uh, as we know, with, with homelessness, uh, there tends to be the connection with substance use. And so that is the community that has been highly impacted. Okay, Carolyn, we need to know more about this, this toxic drug supply. First of all, can you help us with any of where we left off there? By whom, why, how, etc. So most of the people, over 90% of the people who have an overdose uh, with drugs uh, are getting their drugs from an unregulated source. So we use the term drug dealers or somebody from the street. And we know that a very large proportion of those drugs aren't the pure form that they are expecting. Uh, so for example, in fentanyl, which is a common reason people overdose, over 50% uh, of those will uh, actually be tainted or contaminated with, a, or mixed, I should say, with another, another kind of opiate that's much higher potency. Another 50% or uh, uh, of those will have a benzodiazepine. And actually currently, in Toronto at least, 25% of the, f the drugs that people think are fentanyl actually have a horse tranquilizer in them right now. Which makes them what? So, so what happens is when we see this in the emergency department, we see that uh, the uh, patient's heart rate goes down, their blood pressure goes down, and their respiratory rate goes down, which is incredibly dangerous. That's a similar effect as fentanyl alone, but with fentanyl, bystanders or EMS can give them Narcan. In a toxic drug like this, we don't always have anything that we can reverse that with, and so it's an incredibly dangerous situation right now. Jennifer, this may be an incredibly stupid question, but it wouldn't be the first time I've asked an incredibly stupid question. If, if drug dealers are passing along toxic drugs to their customers, uh, presumably that's not good for business. Why don't they care about killing the golden goose that is laying the golden eggs that is making them money? 
I don't have the answer to that. I, I totally agree. I think it's a question that we've all been asking. I also think that possibly this could be um, trying this out, uh, trying to see if the potency is is at a deadly rate or if it's something that can be tolerated um, and therefore sold for, for higher amounts of money um, on a population that is vulnerable and unable to protect itself. I don't mean this as an insult, but even as I talk to you now, you kind of sound overwhelmed and exhausted by the whole thing. How are you holding up? Um, we are. We're tired. Um, all of us, not, not so much just myself, I mean the frontline teams. You know, we're, we're, we're tired across the board. This is something that's affected our emergency responders, our police officers, our um, community supports. Um, from fire to EMS, uh, and then into our social service agencies. And we're already all running on such small budgets. Um, and we're we're very thin on the front line as it is that not one of us is, is willing to give up and go home. We all want to make sure that everyone's safe at the end of the day. So, you know, we put in that extra time to protect as many people as we can. But it's I guess exhausting. It I guess I should ask you the same thing, which is how much of this are you seeing in your emergency departments and is it overwhelming the staff there? Yes, it's overwhelming and we work very closely with our paramedic colleagues and our colleagues in the community in Toronto, but I would say that this is an issue across Ontario uh, and all of my emergency department colleagues and, and, and colleagues in the community like Jennifer are feeling overwhelmed. And are you seeing so many patients because people are accidentally overdosing or because they're taking toxic drugs? I, I would uh, suggest that uh, unintentional or accidental overdose, um, nobody I know when I see them in the emergency department intentionally overdose. So they're all accidental, they're all unintentional, but their intention is to take something that they think they know, but it's often uh, contaminated with one of these other drugs, which causes them to end up needing emergency department care. And so what we're seeing in the emergency department is increased volume at times, like right now, uh, of people with overdoses. We're seeing patients that take a lot longer to clear from that overdose. Uh, just last week, I had a patient that had been in our department for over 18 hours. Uh, we're therefore also seeing longer waits with our ambulance colleagues. So the paramedics will bring a patient into the departments and, and emergency departments across uh, Canada and especially Ontario are are so blocked right now for so many different reasons that we often don't have a place to put that person into a resuscitation room or an acute care monitored room and so they stay on stretchers with ambulance uh, paramedics in our hallways as they wait it's 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 it is really a crisis right now and and emergency departments are just one of many groups feeling it Jennifer have you or I guess I should ask you uh, how much staff turnover do you have as a result of the inundation that you're dealing with right now? Staff turnover, I would say I have the most incredible staff ever. I'm sure everybody thinks that, but I really do. Uh, the staff turnover rate is low, um, but the sick time is definitely up. People are tired. Um, they have to they have to step away for a little while to regroup and recover. And and so, you know, that is the part that we're seeing that more of that sick time. And oh, I think we got a little technical situation here. So let's move on then. Sheldon going to go to the top of page three here because the spike in Belleville has prompted its mayor, Neil Ellis, to issue this urgent plea. And I'll read this for those listening on podcast. We as a city know that we are at the point where doing our best doesn't cut it anymore. Our emergency services, healthcare system, and municipal resources are being stretched to the very limits, and we are close to a breaking point. We need serious action and support from senior level government to deal with this crisis, and until we begin to see meaningful discussions on how to address the matter, I fear nothing will change. That is why we are calling on the province and federal government for support. I urge our local municipal partners facing the same issues to do the same. Okay, how would you, Carolyn, let's start with you. How would you assess the contribution the provincial government has currently made to alleviating the situation? I think that we have to be careful of just making this one government's issue. The idea that healthcare and addiction and mental health are just 
health care and just a provincial issue is something we have to get over. The siloing of health care as, as just a, a provincial issue is an issue. So it's all hands on deck. It basically. is all hands okay. on deck. Uh, homelessness and shelter uh, support is a municipal issue. Uh, the addictions, mental health, health care is both a provincial and a federal issue. And we often see them passing the buck to each other at the detriment of our of our citizens. So they are not the, the different orders of government are not working well together that you can see in order to make progress. Uh, you fair? know, and, and I think that's exactly right. I think that in Toronto we've seen a, a, a change in the last year with, with uh, Mayor Olivia Chow. I think that she's been working more closely and we've seen those announcements more recently where there is definitely some some movement towards some improvement in these areas. But but we are still at such an overwhelming level of need that far, far more needs to happen at all three levels of government. And uh, I think it's important when, when uh, I speak as an emergency physician, as an Ontarian, to recognize that's not the case in all counties and in all, in all, and in all areas of Ontario. We have a, a, very, uh, a very big hill to climb, hmm. mountain. Okay. Not a hill, a mountain. A mountain to gotcha. climb on this. Yeah. Jennifer, how about you? In your experience, the different orders of government, how well or not are they working together to make some progress here? I would agree. I don't think they're working together very well at all. Um, and I think that we're starting to see these systems break down because of that. Um, we were very fortunate that we had a mayor that got behind us and said, you know, I see what's going on and I'm not going to be afraid to speak out about it. I'm going to do something about it instead of you know, just, just telling you that it'll get better in time. And we were really, really fortunate for that because he really did step up when we needed him to step up. And I think the government on all levels needs to do the same. Okay. Safe consumption sites, Carolyn, do we have those in Toronto? Yeah, we have about 10 in Toronto right now, uh, and about five of them are actually in the in the area near St. Michael's Hospital where I work. Uh, and. Uh, they're incredibly important for saving lives. How come? Because uh, we've talked a lot about the toxic drug supply, and I said nobody I know uh, that we see in our emergency departments intentionally overdose. And they want to use, when they're using drugs, they want to use them safely. And so a safe consumption site allows them to come in and do it in a supervised manner, and should they be taking a drug that actually has one of the toxic uh, add add additions to it, mm -hmm. then they can be uh, cared for by people who are trained. And they are also there supported by peer uh, outreach workers and a community where they can uh, ensure that the right resources are in place to help people who are managing addictions. Jennifer, do we have any sites in Belleville? We don't. We have zero sites in Belleville. Do you need some? Absolutely, we do. <laughs> um, I mean, that's definitely something that we would push for. Um, what we've been told in the past is that there's there's quite a bit of red tape to get through to um, be able to, ha to have a site. Um, but I think a lot of our, our immediate issue with, um, with that type of support in place. I'm sure there are people watching us or listening to us right now who think that if you have safe injection sites that are administered the way that Carolyn just described them, you are still enabling dangerous and harmful behavior. What would you say to those folks? People use for all types of different reasons um, and they're going to use regardless of what people think of that. And so if, at least if they're using in a place where it's safe and um, they have support to help them, it's better than using on the street where people are they're dying. Um, right now, you know, we have staff constantly out checking on, on our guests uh, just to make sure everybody's okay. Um, but that's an added stressor on the staff to be constantly vigilant, um, making sure our citizens are okay. Okay. I saw you nodding your head during that answer, so I'm not going to ask you. I have could, more to contribute could, to that, though. Well, okay, if you want to, go ahead. Yeah. yeah. So over 90% of people who die from an overdose die at home. And I think that's really important for Ontarians to know. Unsupervised, in other Unsupervised. Words. They don't want to die. They are dying 
because they're using drugs in a place where they're not together with others. The other important piece is that there have been, just this month, the Ontario HIV Network did a systematic review, a review of systematic reviews, I should say, and, and on all different levels of concern. Does it uh, make it less safe near a uh, uh, safe consumption site for the public? It, it, it doesn't. Uh, we we uh, look at um, improved safety for the individual, for the community. All of those point to the importance of safe consumption sites. In Alberta, they last year did a look at uh, does it increase or decrease emergency department visits and deaths. And when cities have safe consumption sites, it actually decreases the emergency department visits. It decreases the death. And they even looked at, well, what about compared to some of the cities where they're using uh, Narcan only, like trying to distribute more Narcan. And those places, didn't see the decrease, in fact, saw a bit of an increase, just probably likely to the increase in actual use of drugs in some of those. What I think our governments need to do, and right now Ontario government has put a halt on uh, review, or is reviewing the safe consumption sites, is they need more of them. I'm going to finish on this question here. There's every likelihood, Jennifer, that uh, somebody from Health Minister Jones or Mental Health and Addictions Minister Tobolo's offices are watching this or reading an account of it after the fact. So give them some advice. What do you want them to do? I need them to step up. <laughs> what does that and mean, I, though? I need them to do it. I need, we need supports. All of us need the supports and the resources in place to do our jobs. And, uh, and that requires the funding to do them. Um, and like I said, we don't need the funding three months from now. We need the funding now um, in order to be able to effectively address what's happening in our community. Carolyn, what would you add to that? Uh, I would add, um, moving forward with safe consumption sites, I would uh, add that uh, we need to make sure that we're funding the outreach workers and the support workers, both out in the community, um, but also in our emergency departments in order to manage this crisis right now. We are currently using at, at our hospital multiple outreach workers who are funded by donors as opposed to our hospital, as opposed to our governments, and yet they are our most critical human resource in helping us manage this. And so we really need to start understanding and moving from this idea of nice to have outreach workers and support workers on the front lines in our communities and our hospitals and other areas like this to realizing they are an essential part of the social care network that we provide to Ontarians. Well, I thank both of you for coming into TVO tonight, both virtually and actually, to share your expertise on this issue. Jennifer Cormier from the John Howard Society of Belleville and Dr. Carolyn Snyder, ER physician. Unity Health Toronto. Thanks to both of you. Thank you. Thank you. If there's one city in Ontario which has had an occasionally rocky relationship with its francophone minority, it's Sault Ste. Marie. 34 years ago, city council there overwhelmingly passed a resolution to make the Sioux an officially unilingual English city. Some Anglophones liked the idea of putting the French in their place. Some Francophones felt like second-class citizens. Well, 34 years later, the Sioux has returned to the French-English controversy, but with a very different outcome. And here is the mayor of Sault Ste. Marie, or perhaps I should say Sault Ste. Marie, Matthew Shoemaker, with more on this. Your Worship, welcome back to TVO. Thank you, Steve. Great to see you again. Let's start by having you take us back. Let's go back to 1990. What was going on in the Sioux that made City Council vote 11 to 2 to be a unilingual English city? The uh, circumstances of the time were that the Meech Lake uh, accord was being debated across the country, fervently debated, I might add. Uh, bill uh, 8, the provincial government bill, expanding French language services to communities throughout the uh, province had uh, been passed and was coming into force, uh, you know, at varying stages throughout the period of 86 to 90. And there was uh, pushback from municipalities and the Sioux uh, had a uh, significantly uh, popular petition that uh, circulated amongst the city to declare the Sioux a English only community. It uh, met the favor of the council of the day and uh, 
we uh, passed what was called or what became known as the English only resolution and uh, are, I think, still paying for it uh, many years later. But we'll, we'll, uh, we'll return to that notion of how the city may or may not be paying for it. But what did the designation effectively mean? It, well, it was ultimately determined to be uh, outside of our legal authority to pass. Four so, years later, though. Yes, but, multiple years later, mm -hmm. but it uh, it uh, meant that the Sioux would conduct itself in English, that the working language of the city would be English, and it was rightfully seen as a uh, slap in the face of Francophone community members. And if you were a Francophone and you wanted services in French at City Hall, you couldn't get them? Simple as that? I, I think it was, you know, you might, you'd, you'd be relying on good luck if that were the mm -hmm. case. What about the, uh, so uh, we mentioned in the intro, some English parts of Sault Ste. Marie thought this was appropriate. Francophone parts of the Sioux, how do they react? They reacted as I think you would expect of uh, them at the time. There were uh, protests, there were court challenges, ultimately successful. There were people moving out of the city. There were uh, you know, reports in the papers of the day of uh, numerous people leaving the city, French teachers, French families. Uh, there was uh, uh, open, I would say, uh, uh, conflict between Anglophones and Francophones in the community, uh, open debate, uh, you know, at grocery stores and places of worship that uh, uh, would, uh, people, Francophone community members would encounter and retell the stories of to this day. So it was, it was, it was a negative scene for sure. A big deal locally, but what about uh, in the rest of the province? Did it have legs? It did, yes. It uh, became, uh, we became the lightning rod for Francophone, Anglophone uh, uh, discord in the, in the country. And, uh, you know, there were, uh, newspapers across the country uh, saying that Sault Ste. Marie had, you know, forgotten the history of our country, the foundations of our country, the history of our own city, which is, as you note, a French named city, Sault Ste. Marie. Um, and, uh, you know, it became a, a, a symbol for the, the Meech Lake Accords and the, and the uh, tension that came with uh, the Meech Lake Accords. It became a symbol for the dispute uh, amongst uh, majority English communities that were, you know, potentially facing uh, the, the cost of offering Francophone services. Now, the Sioux wasn't included in that ultimately, uh, and it was one of the things that uh, was thrown out there as a bit of a red herring at the time, that we would be forced to provide uh, Francophone services, but ultimately that um, was never intended to be the purpose of Bill 8, and, and we wouldn't have been forced to provide francophone services. Just a word, Bill 8 was the, was the act of the legislature proposed by David Peterson's Liberal government that gave extra French, French language services where numbers warranted. That's right. And okay. Sault Ste. Marie's numbers didn't warrant, but it, was, it, it took on a mythology of its own. Hmm. Not to get too personal here, but were you even alive when any of this happened? I, uh, I was about one and a half at the time <laughs> this all took place in 1990. And uh, it, uh, you know, I had the fortune of going to French school after uh, I, I became a student in, in the 90s and 2000s. And um, learned about this because, uh, you know, many of the families of uh, fellow students that I went to, to school with, many of the teachers were directly affected by the decisions taken in 1990. Well, because I was going to say, you clearly didn't live through this, so that's that was not the impetus for presumably your bringing this forward. So you wanted to make a change. What was the impetus, in fact? The impetus was after I was elected mayor in uh, November of 2020. Um, the, there was much media coverage in the Northern Ontario media about uh, the fact that Sault Ste. Marie had elected a first uh, Frank, French speaking mayor. And uh, it, it gave me the sense that something was still off amongst Francophone and Anglophone relations in the community because I noted that, you know, I had gone to school with a lot of the people that, uh, that were affected by this, but it had been. 20 years since I had been in elementary school, so uh, uh, it wasn't something at top of my mind. But as these, uh, the, as the media coverage uh, focused on that aspect of my election, it caused me to have conversations with Francophone community members, and I, I felt that there was still lingering uh, a lingering scar that uh, Francophone community members felt from the council decision. So, what have you done instead? So uh, over the course of uh, the last little while, I drafted uh, what I have been referring to as the French Language Services Resolution that offers um, a Francophone help to residents who come to City Hall to navigate services at uh, our, our municipal offices. So essentially making sure that there is always someone on city staff that is available to assist someone who wants to come to City Hall and speak French because it's their maternal language. As of when? Well, as of the resolution date, which was January 29th, 
2024, several weeks ago, which is the 34th anniversary of the English only resolution passing. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, the hope is, you know, it's probably going to take us uh, a couple weeks to develop a policy. We're a few weeks later at this point. Um, but uh, the idea is we will be able to immediately draw upon many francophones that work in City Hall to assist uh, residents uh, navigate municipal services. How is this different? Because I do remember Mayor uh, John Rosewall, this is probably how long ago now, 15 years maybe ago, he did offer an apology to the Francophone community. So how is this either different to or complementary of all of that? I think it builds on that. Mayor Roswell offered a, an apology in 2010. Uh, Mayor Provenzano, another of my predecessors, um, Rose, uh, uh, raised the uh, Franco-Ontarian flag at City Hall in 2015. This is the next step, I think, in that healing uh, journey. And there was some question as to whether or not there was council endorsement of Mayor Roswell's apology. Uh, this, I wanted to be sure, uh, covered all the bases. So it uh, it's to ensure that we can offer French language services. It had the endorsement of the unanimous council on uh, two weeks ago. And uh, it was uh, developed uh, in conjunction or in consultation, I should say, with the Francophone community to ensure that whatever lingering um, uh, issues or, or concerns they had with previous apologies or flag raisings or, of course, the initial motion itself, the 1990s English language uh, resolution, would be uh, hopefully uh, put behind us. And what's been the reaction this time? Overwhelmingly positive. Uh, Even from the English? You know what, the, the ang Anglophone community or the majority community in Sault Ste. Marie had put this behind them a long time ago. And um, the issue was it had been put behind uh, the Anglophone community, you know, we had, we had put it behind us as Anglophone majority community members, but without ever seeing if there was any work left to do to heal the divisions that the 1990s resolution created. And so the Francophone community still felt like it had this lingering, uh, you know, um, th this lingering issue with uh, council never having either repealed the motion or formally apologized it from a vote of council. And so that's what we tried to resolve this past uh, Monday by saying, we are going to ensure that you've got services available to you in your mother tongue. And it was done, uh, you know, with uh, their input and uh, hopefully uh, moves forward on a positive path. Now, now, if I recall, the mayor of the Sioux, when this happened, was a guy named Joe Fratesi. And uh, he, he was sort of the guy who was behind the English-only resolution. And somebody asked him the other day, what do you think of this? And he, he wasn't all that thrilled with this development. He said, you shouldn't have done this because it's, quote, picking at an old scab. And there were other priorities that he felt you should be focused on instead. What's your reaction to that? I am uh, not generally in the business of uh, critiquing my predecessor's uh, but actions. But you'll make an exception for us here today. But the uh, the resolution, I think, speaks to what I thought of the decision from 1990. It, uh, the, the, the text of the resolution makes clear what I think of the 1990s decision. And uh, to get into a push and pull with their, my predecessor uh, would be a disservice to what the motion actually does, which is to try and heal old wounds, not to drum up old battles. So I'm not uh, uh, going to engage, but I think that uh, the resolution speaks for itself. When all this French-English stuff was going on three and a half decades ago, the Premier, as I said earlier, was David Peterson. And w when he would go to the Sioux, and particularly when he tried to speak, as he always, almost always did, uh, in both official languages of the country, uh, he did get a bit of a rough ride in the Sioux from time to time. I wonder if um, you've heard from him on all of this. I have. I uh, had sent him, as a courtesy, the copy of the motion prior to it passing, and he was uh, uh, rather supportive. He thought that it was an excellent step in, the, uh, you know, in, in trying to, as I, as I noted, heal the wounds of the past and, and make right what I think was an incorrect decision back in 1990. Uh, does the council know that he's essentially in favor of what you're trying to do here? I did ask him uh, if I could share his email with council, and it did form part of the council agenda on January 29th. So not only council is aware, but the community at large is, uh, or should be aware, uh, that he was uh, extremely uh, complimentary of uh, the efforts that council was undertaking. And one more on this. When you spoke at council about this, what language did you speak in? I used both official languages. I. Uh, 
started in French. I thought that was a way to, the, the gallery was uh, quite full of uh, Francophone community members who came out to support the decision of council. So I wanted to know, I wanted this to be the first uh, foray into that uh, community, knowing that French was uh, a language that they should feel comfortable using at city council. And so I did my, uh, my uh, speech uh, to the community and to the Francophone members uh, in, in French and f followed it up with an English copy. Gotcha. Okay, on this program tonight, we are also going to be taking a look at the opioid epidemic around Ontario, and I really can't have you sitting here and not ask you about this because you represent a part of Ontario where this is a major thing. What does it look like on the streets of Sault Ste. Marie today? It's, uh, it's, it's a challenging file that we are unable to get ahead of. We have, other than Thunder Bay, the highest toxicity rates, the highest hospitalization rates, the highest overdose uh, uh, hospitalizations and deaths uh, from opioid use uh, in the province. And we are continually lobbying the provincial government to assist us with additional services, be they supervised consumption, which of course the province has paused at the moment, uh, be they mental health and addictions, uh, uh, clinical type services that we can uh, rely on or that we can direct residents to because it is filling up our shelters, filling up our emergency rooms, uh, taxing the uh, mental health uh, providers that we've got in town. And it's uh, a file that, you know, the North does, uh, the North as a whole, from Northwestern to Northeastern Ontario, does poorer in, in uh, outcomes than Southern Ontario, where you've got more proximity to uh, withdrawal management, more proximity to rehabilitation services, and a lot more uh, funded and open supervised consumption mm -hmm. sites. Whereas in the North, you've got one funded one in Thunder Bay, two which are open and municipally funded in Timmins and Sudbury that had, have never received provincial approval, and the Sioux, which is uh, traveling down the path of wanting to open one, but unable to do so because of the provincial review. We have a premier right now who famously says, I am accessible to any municipal official. They've all got my phone number. They can call me anytime they want and make their pitch. Have you done that directly with the premier? I have. He was in the Sioux uh, last winter and we discussed uh, this issue. He had to take off, so he uh, gave me his phone number and I did follow up with a phone call to him. It was uh, a productive call. I think he was receptive to the fact that Northern Ontario's needs are um, more critical in this area than Southern Ontario's needs. But ultimately it was, you know, this is an issue for my health minister, my uh, associate minister of mental health and addictions to look at. And so I'll put you in contact with them. And we've lobbied them uh, a, a significant number of times without the response that we'd hoped for. Without the response you want, what's Correct. it gonna take? Well, uh, I, I, I don't know what it will take, but I do know that during the period uh, that this continual delay for the requests we've made for funding for our hospital to run certain programs, that the number of deaths continue to rise. And so each passing month that uh, we don't get an answer that uh, we think would help our community is a month that there is going to be more deaths and uh, higher statistics in Sault Ste. Marie than there are elsewhere. Uh, in our last 30 seconds here, the Sioux is represented by a Conservative MPP. Is he helpful? Uh, he he uh, he certainly is helpful in bringing the message uh, to Queen's Park. It hasn't seemed to uh, get the result that we are hoping for, but I'm in relatively constant communication with uh, MPP Romano, and uh, I know that he has said in the past that he's supportive of supervised consumption. It's one of these things that, you know, if it's the government's policy of the day to pause uh, uh, approvals of these, then I suspect that a lone member who supports it uh, probably is not going to be able to change the tide of uh, the province's thinking. Okay. That's uh, His Worship, Matthew Shoemaker, the Mayor of Sault Ste. Marie, Sault Ste. Marie. Merci beaucoup. Uh, C'était un grand plaisir de... You know what? I shouldn't have quit French in high school, but let me just say, un plaisir de partager, partager cette émission avec vous aujourd'hui. Merci. Merci, Steve. Renowned Canadian gynecologist and best-selling author Dr. Jen Gunter stops by to talk about her latest book, Blood, The Science, Medicine and Mythology of Menstruation. There's Shark Week, uh, my gal, uh, the English are coming, uh, there's communists in the funhouse. I think those are the ones I can think of off the top of my head.
My name is Dr. Jen Gunter, and I'm an OBGYN and pain medicine specialist. I work as a physician, and I'm also an author and a health communicator. My latest book is called Blood, The Science, Medicine, and Mythology of Menstruation. I think using euphemisms depends on context. So I think if you feel you have to use it because you're told you can't talk about your body, well, we need to change that. But if you're having fun with your friends, go for it. Why is it so challenging to talk about menstruation? I think there's a couple of reasons. I mean, one, we've been told since the beginning of time it's shameful and people don't want to talk about shameful things, right? Or people feel embarrassed to say the word and so they just don't talk about it. They don't hear anybody else talking about it, so you think it's taboo, you, you, it's something you're not allowed to talk about. And finally, people don't know much if they know anything about the biology. So I think a lot of people are embarrassed because they think they should know, though, and they don't even know the questions they should ask. So I think there's several reasons. Explaining why we menstruate is a pretty complex biological phenomenon, but let, let me see if I can distill it down. So it really is part of resource curation in pregnancy. So during the menstrual cycle, we develop a very thick uterine lining, and this is for a couple of reasons. It's a special lining called the decidua. And think of it like a catcher's mitt in a way for an embryo. When an embryo, a human embryo, meets decidua, what it wants to do is bury straight down. The embryo wants to get to maternal blood vessels because it wants that oxygen. It's very invasive. So we need a very thick lining to deal with that invasiveness. In addition, there's all kinds of immunological signals and triggering that's going on. And this decidua, the specialized tissue, is dealing with that. The decidua also can sense if embryos are really abnormal and actually trigger a miscarriage very early on. That's one of the reasons you might have heard that about 70% of early pregnancies end in miscarriage. That's part of the decidua, trying to make sure that the pregnancies that do happen are the healthiest possible because it's a massive biological investment to be pregnant. So you've got this really thick specialized decidua, which is the lining of the uterus that's been converted by exposure to the hormone progesterone. You don't get pregnant, so now what? You have this thick specialized tissue and you have to get rid of it. It can't be absorbed because we don't have a mechanism to digest it. So the only way to get rid of it is to dump it and then start the cycle again. Some people think that, you know, because it's bodily fluid leaving your body, it's gross. And, you know, some people might think about that as same as urine or feces or saliva or nasal secretions, right? So it isn't any grosser than those. And so I think that for centuries, we've had this special idea that menstrual fluid is some kind of like toxy, witchy, poisonous brew, like really specially poisonous. I mean, people used to think that menstruating women were vampires. They used to think that menstruation had some involvement with rabies. They used to think that that when women were menstruating, they would poison food. They, you know, so nobody, everybody urinates, but nobody thinks people who have a full bladder are going to poison food. So menstruations had this really sort of super nasty, toxic, witchy phenomenon associated with it. So I'm often asked if people in proximity will sync their menstrual cycles, and the answer is no. That is a very common myth that people believe if you're in dorm or you work with a bunch of other women, that all your menstrual cycles are going to in sync and you're going to have this sort of like menstrual gal pal sort of thing. Uh, and it's not true. It's uh, based in mythology. There is no science to back it up. There is no biological mechanism by which that could happen. This always gets people a bit worked up, but there are no pheromones involved. In fact, no one has ever proved that humans have pheromones. I know that can, the, uh, the whole sort of perfume industry would like you to think otherwise. Uh, we also don't have the organ to detect, a functioning organ to detect pheromones. So your menstrual cycle is related to everything that's happening in your own biology. Um, and this whole idea of cycle syncing has been disproven by science. And there's no biological way it could happen either. Menstruation, is it tied to the cycle of the moon? And the answer is no. If it were, we'd all menstruate at the same time, just like the tides, you know, happen at the same time, right? So, so no, it's not tied to the moon. The idea, I think, came about because there's a lot of similar language. And this whole idea about um, the menstrual cycle being monthly, uh, 
was tied to the idea that the moon waxes and wanes in a monthly cycle as well, right? Because month comes from the same, uh, you know, the same uh, uh, sort of language as menstruation does. It's from mens as month or monthlies, right? So, but that doesn't mean that the ancient people who noticed this connection between the menstruation and the sort of the monthly waxing and waning of the moon, they didn't think the moon was dragging you into menstruation. They said, wow, this is something that comes in a cycle, like the moon comes in a cycle. So it's a reflection of the cycle, not of the moon dragging you into menstruation. I'm often asked if people need to take a break from hormonal contraception, and the answer is no, unless you want to get pregnant. Um, but there's no medical reason that you need to stop. There isn't any blood that's building up, any lining of the uterus that's getting super thick and needs to come out. Uh, if you need contraception, you need it. Also, it's very important to mention that many people use hormonal contraception not for contraception, but to control heavy bleeding, to control period pain, or because they just don't want to have a period. And so all of these are very valid and important reasons. So this has been on TikTok and a few other places, I suppose, that menstrual blood has anti-aging properties. And I mean, no, I mean, if it did, our vaginas would never age, right? Like, you know, because they would be bathed in special anti-aging serum, uh, you know, once a cycle. So this is sort of, both sort of plays into the idea that menstrual blood is sort of special and witchy and, you know, you it, well, some people use it to sort of tell people, oh, your blood is toxic and other people say, oh, it's sort of magical. It's true, there are stem cells in the, the endometrium, the decidua that comes out. And it is also true that the uterus with menstruation is the only time in the human body where scarless healing happens. That's pretty fascinating, right? Like if you cut yourself somewhere else, there'll always be under the microscope a sign that there was an injury, but it's completely scarless healing. So yes, there are stem cells and all kinds of cool sort of regenerative things happening that it, we don't quite understand. And if we could understand it, I think we could really apply that technology probably in a lot of incredibly fascinating ways for human health. However, all of that happens because, you know, when you study something in a lab, you do all kinds of things to it to, to make it work in different ways. So just taking, you know, menstrual blood and putting it on something isn't going to slow any kind of aging down. And also that's ageist. I hate anti-aging, right? We see that all the time on TikTok and, and Instagram and you need to worry you know, anti-aging stuff. And so, so yeah, no, menstrual blood is menstrual blood. It's super cool. The fact that it's scarless healing, super cool, uh, but that's it. So this has almost become gospel, the idea that natural menstrual products are better for you. And I'm going to say natural, uh, because natural doesn't mean anything. I could call something natural. I could make a birth control pill and call it natural. I could tell you that the hormones were made from soybeans, which they are, and then I could tell you it's natural. So yeah, no, there is no studies that tell us that products that advertise themselves as natural or organic are better. And in fact, sometimes these products don't perform as well. So, and I'm not saying you should be scared about them, but there is absolutely no medical reason that you should be spending your money on products that advertise themselves as natural or organic. You know, it's natural to bleed all over yourself. So yeah, no, natural is a marketing term and avoid people that use it. Thinking about menstrual education kind of in days gone by versus now, I am sad to say that I don't think it's really improved that much. I mean, I think there are probably still schools where, you know, if they teach anything, people are segregated, uh, you know, to have the boys and the girls learn different things, even though everybody benefits from the menstrual cycle. And that, you know, perpetuates also the idea that this is shameful or something you can't like discuss with everybody, right? If you have to segregate people to talk about it. Uh, you know, some schools, you know, do some sex ed discussion, but almost always that's kind of the whole putting a condom on a banana thing. It's a very cursory discussion about not getting pregnant, not about any of the mechanics involved with sex or how the body works biologically. So, you know, I've yet to really speak to someone who has, you know, graduated school with a really robust knowledge about the menstrual cycle, which is of course, you know, why I wrote the book Blood. Well, I talk a lot about influencers because they influence people and they are having a negative effect on a lot of people. When I think about the menstrual disinformation that I see on social media, it's 
it's really enraging. Um, and I see it from, you know, people with no education to people who are masquerading like they have some kind of knowledge and to people who are actually physicians. A while back, I saw a physician saying that if you, uh, if your period lasts more than one day, there's something wrong with you. And of course, you know, whatever, buy my supplements, come do my special hormone testing, right? Which is, you know, it's normal to bleed up to seven days. So, you know, that's somebody who's promoting disinformation. There's almost always a sell job behind it. So people are trying to sell supplements or sell expensive testing that then they have to interpret for you or a special diet related to the menstrual cycle. And a lot of this is really, um, you know, very insidious and maybe not easy to see. Some of it's an outright ad. So you see sort of everything in between. I see people afraid to use menstrual products. Somebody showed me a video on TikTok the other day with this woman claiming that if you use menstrual products, it will make your periods heavier and give you more cramps. So, so what the alternative is then for women to take to their beds for four days, five days a month, like that's, that's the kind of thinking from the 1500s. And so people need to be very careful because a lot of this menstrual misinformation and disinformation is very much attached to old predatory ideas about women not leaving the house. So I, the best quote on people saying, well, you know, alternative medicine has its place because there's gaps in medicine. I would say Dr. Ben Goldacre has this fantastic saying that I am going to paraphrase. If there is a problem with the airline industry, the answer is not to invest in magic carpets. People deserve science-backed healthcare. Alternative medicine is things that haven't been tested. Should you go in an airplane that hasn't been tested? Should you drive a car that hasn't been tested? Many of these things, we have no idea what they could do to your body. Supplements are completely unregulated. I know people in Canada think, oh, Health Canada looks at these. No, they don't. They just take whatever the supplement company says is in them. Um, there have been many cases of supplements being, uh, you know, having lead and other problems identified here and products bought off the shelf in Canada. So um, the answer to gaps in medicine is not to exploit them with pseudoscience. The answer to the gaps in medicine is to appropriately fund the healthcare system, to appropriately fund research, to demand that we study things that affect women's bodies on par with things that affect men's, men's bodies. The, the answer is not to move away from the scientific method and the fact that there are people exploiting these very real gaps. I mean, having eight minutes or 12 minutes with a doctor is not fair and it is wrong, but the answer to that isn't somebody selling you garbage on TikTok. So we've heard a lot of discussions about period poverty and period poverty is basically the concept that some people can't afford the products they need to control their menstrual cycle. So it's not bleeding on, so they're not bleeding onto their clothes or onto their bed linens. And period poverty keeps women in the house. It stops people from going to school. It can even affect people's work. And it's awful to not have enough menstrual products. And this is something that is not new. Um, you know, for centuries, women have had to do what they could to manage. Not everybody could afford to have extra garments to wear. Not every, and, and so the only option was basically to leak on your clothes or to not go out, right? So, and obviously they didn't have modern absorbent technology back in the day either. So there's that. So it's very important that we have equal access to menstrual products because it is completely unfair that someone should have to miss days of school, should have to miss days of employment because they can't afford period products. And every single person benefits from the menstrual cycle. We are all here because of the menstrual cycle. So why are we making half the population pay for it? We don't have any issues with toilet paper being free in bathrooms. We don't have any issues with uh, going into bathrooms and there being um, soap for us to wash our hands. So. If we don't have issues with that, why should we have issues with period products being made available? And one thing that's even especially egregious is in many parts of the world, menstrual products are taxed. And they're not just taxed, luxury item, right? Which is an absolute joke. Not bleeding onto your clothes isn't a luxury, that's a human right. I want everybody in Canada to think about what it's like to live in some communities where it's much more expensive to buy these products. What about people who live remotely in rural communities or up north? How much more expensive these products might be? Might be two, three, four times what you're gonna pay in a large metropolitan area. So we need to think about ways where 
I mean, I think all the products should be free. But until we get to that point, I absolutely believe that menstrual products should be price controlled, that they should cost the same wherever you live in the country. It, whether you live in Yellowknife, whether you live in Churchill, Manitoba, or whether you live in downtown Toronto, it should be the same price that's affordable for everybody. And this is something I, I think all Canadians should be able to get behind. So why did I include a chapter on abortion in a book about menstruation? It's a great question. So in the olden days, we used to call abortion menstrual regulation. That was the euphemism we used for it to get around laws and you know people would come in and have their periods regulated. Uh, or people who had money who could find a safe provider would do that. I think it's really important that people get accurate, factual information about abortion early because there are so many forces that are trying to give people disinformation about abortion. And you never know when you might need an abortion. You never know when you might want an abortion. And so if people learn about that early on, then they can be prepared if that happens to them. And I want everybody to understand the massive impact and inequity of a legal abortion. And so I talk in the book about, you know, maternal mortality in countries where abortion is illegal. And for example, you know, what happens when it becomes legal and how maternal mortality just plummets. The case is clear, the evidence-based, science-backed case is clear that abortion saves lives. So it's very important also from an autonomy standpoint that people have choice about their bodies. So I wanted people to have factual information from a trusted source. We've had a lot of struggles in the United States with abortion legislation. There are many states where it's now illegal and Roe versus Wade was overturned, so there's no federal protection, no federal protection for the right to choose. And I would say that we already know what's happening because of that. We are seeing um, increases in maternal mortality, increases in bad outcomes. I mean, this is no surprise because we know that legal abortion is the right thing for societies. It tells me that people who are happy about Roe versus Wade being overturned, it tells me that they care more about a fetus than they care about the person carrying the fetus. So that can't be a pro-life position because it means they don't care about the life of the person who is pregnant. It's a forced birth position and we need to call them out for what it is. They wanna force people to give birth. That's a way to force people to stay into poverty. It's a way to force people to uh, not be able to live to their full potential. It's a weapon of control. When people are forced into poverty, that might affect their ability to vote. It might affect their ability to, to, to do so many things that are important for their own happiness and for their contribution to society. And the fact that, that we are basically moving backwards is a very, very, very alarming thing. And we are seeing very real repercussions of this. We're seeing people who have had serious medical complications in pregnancy having to fly to different parts of the country to get a life-saving abortion. And we're only hearing about you know, the few that are able to do that. There might be many doing it who don't talk about it. We've heard about young children having to go to a different state to get an abortion because they were raped often, you know, by a caretaker or a family member. The idea that an 11-year-old should be forced to carry a pregnancy because of some politician's political desires, I think people need to understand that politicians get behind forced birth agendas because it's a good way to fundraise and it's a good way to get attention and it's a good way to get elected. It's not a good thing for the electorate. So I hear about a lot of people using menstrual tracking apps, and uh, there's a lot of concerns there. So especially in places if you live somewhere where abortion is illegal, you should never assume that the data you're using in those apps, except for a few that I mentioned in the book, which are downloaded to your phone and don't live on the cloud, your data is being sold. It's being sold. That's why, you know, when you talk about a dress and then two minutes later you see that, like, something from that designer on Instagram, I mean, it's not just that, that your phone is listening, but many apps sell your data, right, to data brokers. And then it's the data brokers who sell that data to the companies that design the ads so they can pick things up and your feed gets filled with those ads. And, you know, that's scary enough, but 
if you're a district attorney and you live somewhere where you want to prosecute someone for having an abortion, you know, for $100, you can buy all the metadata of people who went to a specific Planned Parenthood in a week or so. It's cheap information to buy. So there's that very real safety concern is what's happening to your data. Also, even if you live somewhere like Canada where there's no abortion law, do you really want people being able to access your data? I mean, could an employer for $100 buy data to find out if people are maybe newly pregnant and then ex exclude them from job interviews? That's a possibility, right? There's all kinds of ways your personal data can be abused, right? So first of all, there's that. Then there's the issue that does tracking even do anything for you? So tracking is the idea that if you record when your period is, you're then you're gonna know when your next one is and your next one. And people who promote trackers, and a lot of times this is also from naturopaths and chiropractors who tell you need to be more in tune with your body. You know, they want you to track so they can sell you a supplement or sell you a product. So because if your period is off, then they have an answer to that. Well, there's a really interesting study that looked at, at one of these apps. And the thing is, is these apps that predict when your next period is going to be, they're all proprietary algorithms. So researchers can't look at them to even see if they're accurate. Well, what happened was a group of women tracked their cycles. And when their periods happened at different times when the app predicted, they blamed themselves. They said, oh, well, my body must be broken. The app must be right. But actually, when researchers looked at their cycles, no, their cycles came in the normal expected range. It was the app that was incorrect. So the app can actually make you less in tune with your body. So if you're using an app for fertility awareness method, you want to use one that is not just based on the historical record of your cycles. You want to use one that also includes other biological variables like temperature or cervical mucus, and that's all explained in the book. If you are cycle tracking simply for the purpose of cycle tracking, I would position that that might not be telling you accurately when your next cycle is going to be due. And so, you know, if you're trying to plan things around it because, you know, maybe you have breast tenderness or, and you don't want to, you know, do your arm workouts at that certain time, you may not be getting accurate information and it may be teaching you less about your body. So, you know, is that something that you want to participate in? My name is Dr. Jen Gunter. My latest book is called Blood, The Science, Medicine, and Mythology of Menstruation. Tomorrow on the agenda. Households, according to our research, that convert today to kind of electrifying their home heating, you know, their transportation and other pieces are saving money today and that's likely to even increase over time. That's tomorrow on the agenda.